that you are real in our lives. We're grateful for the prayers of those around us in our most difficult moments. We're grateful that uh, we are not alone, that we have people who share our loves. And so God, we give you thanks for this beloved community, but not just for this community, really for this whole world, because you have not given up on it. And while it is so brutal, it is also so beautiful. So help us, oh God, to not overlook the, the brutalness, but also to dwell in the beauty and to share that with all those we meet, because everyone is your child and everyone needs that good word that you are loved, that they are loved, and that they can love the way we do. And with you and your grace, we will work together to bring healing and wholeness and beauty to this world in need. We can pray these things in confidence because you came to be with us. You walked with us, you laughed with us, you cried with us, and you saved us. And so we pray in these words that you taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thank you so much for reminding us all. I'm sure we all feel like, oh yes, we have been on our hearts. So prayers for the fighting in Israel and Palestine and uh, for the conflict, which is so complicated. I'm not sure it being complicated makes a difference for families who are losing loved ones. So um, lots of prayers that peace beyond understanding can prevail. I also want to mention a word about that because uh, in our, our um, scripture this morning. It's from the prophet Jeremiah. And as people of faith who have inherited these Hebrew scriptures, we have a lot of passages that deal with Israel and land and where God wants them to live. And a word of caution that we cannot take the Bible and apply it directly to today without context, without understanding the millennia of history in between. And so when we read some of these stories, we have to understand this is in their original context. There are many ways to read them in the original context, and it is incredibly complicated. And so we just need to be very, very careful when we uh, talk about Israel. There's ancient Israel and there's current Israel, and they're two different things, even though they share uh, a history. So that's my word of disclaimer. Uh, so, you know, we'll talk more about that if we like. Um, thank you, Joyce. Thank you. So, we are really delighted to have another baptism this morning. And so I'm going to invite the Brinkman family to come forward. Bo and Liam, you get to bring up baby Graham, right? So last week we were able to celebrate Dot and Teddy's baptisms. And uh, I'll say again, I know that we feel a little cheated as a congregation because we had these beautiful children born at the beginning of the pandemic last year. And we are nothing if we are not baby snugglers in this church and i know we all were looking forward to holding these little kids and we didn't get to darn it um, but we do get to celebrate them now and it is such a joy to see them and how they've grown i think we also need to lift up our parents i didn't say this last week but it was hard to be parents we always talk about how you need a village to raise children and suddenly um, your village was gone and you had to do it on your own for a long time so we're really excited to just be able to celebrate and uh, bring a visible representation of God's love. So, uh, boys, are, can you help me? Can you do a little help? Liam, could you hold my, my book for me? So that cause my hands are going to be full in a minute. Here, hold it. There you go. Perfect. And Bo, can you pick up the water and bring that over here? You have to walk slow so it doesn't slosh around too much. But I think you can do it. And maybe you can stand right here. Perfect. Can you guys do that? 
Okay. Um, everyone else, you can join on page 12 in your hymnals if you'd like. But we might not get to all the liturgy because uh, we just are going to celebrate. Yeah. So I have some questions. Liam, can you come just a little closer so I can read these questions? Okay. So I put, oops. <laughs> I do that all the time too. Where'd it go? You know what? I don't think it is page 12, is it? It's page uh, 40. Page 12 is communion. We're not doing that. It's page 40. There you go. You got it. Yeah, hold your finger tight. Perfect. Okay. So Heather and Tyler, I'm going to ask you, on behalf of the whole church, I ask, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, repent of your sins, and reject the evil powers of this world? Do you accept the freedom and prayer God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and nations? And uh, because Graham's too little to answer for himself, I'm going to ask you this. Will you nurture Graham in Christ's holy church? Uh, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself and walk in the way that leads to life. And we know you will. Uh, and now, church, I'm going to ask you a question, and I need this back because I have to answer this question too. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and include this child now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this child with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who leads to life. Ready to pray in the water? I think we can do that. Can you hold that? So you guys remember why we use water, right? Because water is pretty ordinary, and we use it all the time. You can lift it up and let him put his fingers in there. You want to put your fingers in here? <sighs> well, so water is ordinary, but it becomes really, really special, right? We could not even live one day without water. And so it's so special because it keeps us alive. And that's like God. God is with us all the time, and God keeps us alive, too. So it reminds us of God's love. It's around us all the time. We might forget about it, because it's always there, but it keeps us going. Right? Oh, gosh, he's so cute. Okay, can I hold him? Come here, Mr. Graham. Okay, Bo, can you hold up that water really big and tall? Because we're going to put some of this water on Graham's head to remind him that God loves him. Okay, Graham, let's do it together. Ready? Graham, Isaiah, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit work within you, that you may be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and walk in the way that leads to life. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. Want to say some more? Yeah. <laughs> I'll hand him back. Yeah. And I know we can uh, we can celebrate there. Um, there's no oh, more water. So thank you for um, thank you for sharing him with us. And guys, you have to remind him as he grows up, okay, that God loves him no matter what, just like you love him. And we all love him too, okay? He's part of our family, he's part of God's family. So thank you, thank you, thank you. As they're leaving, I'll just remind us that part of worship is not just receiving God's love, but giving as well. And so our offering is part of worship. Uh, we are not gonna pass the plate, um, as that can carry a lot of germs. But you're welcome to carry an offering up to the plate 
later, or you can continue to give the way you've been giving this last year through automatic giving. I found myself saying this week, uh, uh, Christopher and I were talking that we give automatically through the uh, online banking. And I said, it's just nice to do that so I don't even have to think about it. And then I thought, that's not only the point of offering is to not think about it, right? <laughs> I mean, you want to, you do want to think about what you've received from God and how you give as a response of joy and a response of faithfulness. And uh, it's your way to, to participate in God's act of love that you, you give as God gives. So it is good, even if you are giving in electronic ways or ways you don't have to totally think about, it's good to remember and think about that as your act of uh, living in God's world in response to God's love. Let's see. Who's reading scripture? Is it Jan? Jan, would you like to come and read scripture for us? I've already given a little bit of a, a preview, but this is from Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet who spoke to Israel in a very, very difficult time in their history. It was during the uh, exile when they had been conquered by a foreign power and everyone had to scatter and Israel was in ruins, and Jeremiah stayed in the city and um, foretold a day when God would be with them to build them up again. And so Jeremiah always lived in hope. So this passage is near the end of that story when God talks about um, God will make them anew. He's not going to give up on them. He's not just going to, you know, dust off the old covenant. He's going to make a whole new covenant, a whole new relationship with him. One that can't be broken. So thanks, Dan, for reading this. Today's reading comes from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, shall my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This is the word of God for the people of God. Mount Vernon, and it's um, 
an adventure. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very labor intensive way to realize we already live in the best house in the world. So I, I didn't know that. Um, and you know, it has us thinking about uh, desirability. <laughs> I have a friend who's also house shopping in San Diego, which is kind of just an impossible task. It's kind of like you're shopping with Monopoly money, like the numbers are not real. And so she keeps, she and I keep sending these houses to each other that we can afford and they're lovely places, but they're in very, I mean, they're lovely homes, but they're in places like Oklahoma or Ohio or, uh, you know, where our budget will get you a house with 12 bedrooms. Um, and so, you know, it just, uh, location, 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 right? That's what they say in real estate. When we lived in West Virginia, real estate was a really different piece. And I remember uh, one Sunday in my first church, uh, during our, our time of prayers, one couple raised their hand and they said, we would like to thank God because we were finally able to sell my mother's house. And it had been on the market for three years, oh. uh, just sitting there. And so it was such a huge relief to them to not have that, that burden to care for, a financial burden. Um, and I was so struck because uh, that's not a prayer that I'd ever experienced before. Because no one, where I had lived, no one had had that kind of trouble selling a house. It had been on the market for years with no offers. Uh, you know, our house was on the market for three days. And we had two offers and we got to choose one. Um, so, you know, there's desirability. There's places that people want to live and they will pay crazy amounts of money. And then there are places people don't necessarily want to live. And you can get a lot for a very little. Uh, this happens in scripture too. There are times when uh, people come to a place where maybe it seems like you would not want to live there. And it would be foolish to invest, invest your money or invest your heart. In those places and Jeremiah lived in one of those places so in Israel's history they were conquered by the Babylonians and their temple was torn down and it became rubble they were they were conquered and so they got carted off by the Babylonians um, and who was left behind but the people who just you know weren't that important so it was a very dismal time obviously in Israel's life, and they, they were scattered around. But Jeremiah was a prophet from God, and he chose, or God called him, to stay in Jerusalem and to tell the people that God wasn't done with them. Now, Jeremiah probably looked incredibly foolish. He probably looked like he was not with it. He was didn't know how to read the room. <laughs> To announce to a group of people that God was still with them when they had been completely decimated and nothing was left. No people, no buildings. I mean, it was uh, a ruin. And to say, God loves you, when it looks like, hmm, it looks like maybe God doesn't love you. Jeremiah probably looked very foolish. At the end of this story, Jeremiah actually buys some land. He buys a field. He puts, he puts down money on this field of rubble. And people think, boy, what are you doing? That's a terrible real estate investment. Why are you here? Everyone who's anyone has already left. You should really go. But Jeremiah says, no, God is going to rebuild us from the rubble. And I'm going to be here and you should be here too because God loves us and God's not done with us. You know, this, uh, this season in our church life and really in our community, state, country life, we're talking about transitions and God calling us to do a new thing. Um, and we've talked about how a new thing can be very uncomfortable. You know, God set out this covenant with Abraham and Sarah, and the first word he says to them is go, leave your, your country, leave your kinfolk, and go to a new place. Don't worry about the details. I'll show it to you later, but go. Um, we've talked about how uh, it can make you mad. You don't want to go like like Jonah. You know, you don't want to go to that place that God wants you to go to. You want to go to this place. That's your plan you had set out for yourself. 
You don't want to go to that crummy town over there. Sometimes God doing a new thing corrects us. Maybe we've gone astray and God has to say, uh, no, that's not what I really wanted for you. So I've got to stretch a little bit. And that feels, sometimes it can feel like punishment, even though it's not. Today, I think uh, our lesson is sometimes when God does a new thing, it looks foolish. It looks ridiculous. It looks like it doesn't make sense. It looks like uh, you're not with it and you can't understand the times. You just look a little stupid. You know, Jeremiah buying this field that no one else wanted to buy looks very foolish. Him saying, oh, doesn't God love us? When he's looking out at a war-torn land, that looks very foolish. But that's what God wanted. God wasn't giving up on the people, even though they had given up on themselves and God. Jeremiah looked foolish, but it was the right thing. It was the godly thing. I think being people of faith means that sometimes we have to look foolish. We have to look foolish. We have to look uh, like people are going to look at us and say, they don't know what they're doing. You know? Actually, I just remembered the prayer concern I was going to hear. Because we do look a little foolish. So we have this sign out. This is only slightly related. But I do want to tell you about this. So um, we have this sign out on our lawn that says, we're worshiping now outside on the lawn, 10 a.m. Sundays, camps required. Well, we thought this was a great joke, but not many people are getting this joke, so I'm going to explain it. Um, but, you know, if you have been working from home or doing school from home and your whole life is on Zoom now, you know, you get to see this much of people from here up. <laughs> And uh, my brother-in-law has a Zoom shirt. And so when he has a meeting, he gets the shirt off the back of his chair. He puts it on. Nice, you know, shirt. And then when the meeting's over, he takes it off and puts it back on the chair. And he has, like, one shirt for every two weeks or something. And then he's just in, like, his workout clothes. So, you know, the joke is, for pandemic life, you don't really have to wear pants, right? You just, you, you go as you are. From here up, doesn't matter. We were just kind of saying, like, Hey everybody, come back to church again. Just a reminder, put your pants on first, right? Um, Christopher saw that we were on some like lo local Vancouver Vancouver website thing. Like people were like, did they need masks? Why can you wear shorts? Like, is that the like, all right? We church people are just trying to be funny. Sorry. Uh, so we might look a little foolish for our like, okay, people are talking about us. That's good. You know, that's kind of a funny thing. But there's other times we've looked foolish. I know that every other church in Richfield has been worshiping for a year together, and we've been sticking with the remote church. But we've done that out of an abundance of caution so that we keep people safe, even if it means a sacrifice for us. I know that looks a little foolish, and it looks hard to explain. Right? I know that our itinerant system looks a little foolish, and it's a little hard to explain. Why can you just yank a pastor out of a church if everybody's happy? Uh, that doesn't make any sense. How can you just move people who have kids, right? We have kind of these questions of why do we do it this way? There's other times in our faith where we look a little foolish. Uh, I think about my experience growing up as a young adult with uh, Sierra Service Project. It's a, a mission and service organization. And we went on a couple trips to Sierra Service Project here. 2015 and 16, I think, we took a couple. Keely went with me twice, and we had such a good experience. But it's kind of a little foolish, if you think about it. You you drive way out to a Native American reservation, usually in a, a desert or a remote place, and you volunteer to work for a week. Um, and you pay a pretty hefty fee to be there to work and make home repairs. And so it sounds a little foolish to pay to work on somebody else's house. It sounds a little foolish to make really good friends that you will only know for one week, and then you'll drive back to your different parts of the state and not spend too much time again, together. I think it looks really foolish for Native American people to invite uh, descendants of white people who have forced them into a reservation, to invite them as guests into their home and share their food with them and share their culture with them. In one of those times when Healy and I were uh, in Spokane, the tribal leaders took us to their sweat lodge. That's their most sacred place. That'd be like inviting them to the waters of baptism, you know? 
They invited us to their sweat lodge and they shared with us their culture and their customs and their faith. All of these strangers who they didn't know. Maybe we could have gone home and made fun of them, but they still opened their hearts and their homes to us. That looked cool from the outside. Why would you invite people who are probably your enemies to come to your home? All of it looks foolish, but we know because we believe in a God who doesn't give up and who can work amazing miracles of love, it's not foolish. It's actually what God wants us to do, to come together and to heal, to build bridges across division, to give of ourselves, to invest in each other, even if that investment doesn't make sense. When you become, you know, when those kids would get to know each other and become good friends just for five days, it teaches them what good friends are supposed to look and feel like. They don't betray you. They don't make fun of you. They cheer for you. They lift you up. They keep your confidences. They love you for who you are. Right? That's not foolish to make that kind of friendship, even if it's just for five days. That stays with you for your life to remind you what love looks like. Sometimes we're just supposed to be foolish, and I guess we just have to get over that, right? I know it feels foolish right now to have to welcome a new pastor when things are really pretty good, as good as they can be for worshiping on Zoom for six minutes. Um, and yeah, I guess it doesn't totally make sense. I mean, I guess it is foolish. It just doesn't make sense. Why would you change things if you're not broke, right? But I think it's okay to do foolish things. Because it shows that God's love goes beyond what we understand. Yeah, this is a good arrangement. But you know what? The next person is going to be a good arrangement too. When Joanne comes, you're going to realize she has great gifts. And you'll go in a direction you haven't thought of before. You'll discover new things. You'll celebrate like, wow, I didn't know God could do this. Here, with me, and with us. And then she'll have some things that aren't her gifts. And you'll be like, Man, she can't do that. I guess I can do that, right? And you'll step up and discover your gifts that you have, that you can share, and that you can fill in where she doesn't have those things. And it's like, you know, if we hadn't had our old pastor leave, we never would have discovered these new things in us. So yeah, it's foolish. I've heard some people say, this is stupid. <laughs> I don't disagree. You know what? You're right. Sometimes this is stupid. That doesn't mean it's not what God wants, right? That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. God asks us sometimes to do really stupid, foolish things. Jeremiah had to do a stupid, foolish thing. He bought this plot of land. He invested in the people who weren't worth investing in because God invested in them. And then we have at the end of that story this beautiful passage where God says, I'm not just going to I'm not just going to do the old covenant better. I'm going to make a new covenant with you. I'm going to make a covenant that's so strong and so real that you're not going to be able to break it. You won't even have to teach it to each other. You won't have to say, I'm your God and you're my people. And You won't learn it that way because it's going to be in you. It's going to be in your heart. It's going to be in the air you breathe and the water you, you drink. It's just going to be part of who you are. You won't have to teach it to your children because they will already know. They will know that they are mine and they belong to me no matter what. And I guess that looks foolish to the world. But to us, we know that it is right. And so if we look a little silly sometimes, if we have jokes we have to explain in public, um, if we do things that are stupid and make us mad, it's okay because it's part of God doing a new thing in us. And in the end, it won't look foolish or stupid. It will look like new life. So thanks be to God. So friends, let's have our musicians come back up and uh, we'll sing together. Uh, in the through the valley of the shadow, perfect is casting out fear. In the middle of the storms of the storm, I will turn back and know you, and I will fear no evil. 
for my God is with me. Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. 
and a big old fashioned work party here next Saturday, like from about nine to one. It's time we spit things up. Company's coming. But yeah, gotta do it. So um, bring cleaning products and tools that you are fond of and be prepared to work outside, work inside, clean windows, vacuum, uh, get those weeds out of the flower beds, whatever your favorite chore is. Come and enjoy some fellowship and some good hard work, and we'll get the place shined up for the summer. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Jan. Yes, our poor church. Um, everything is not in its right spot. It is all helter skelter in here. So we're going to put it back together and, uh, and stiff it up. Uh, our building takes such good care of us, even in the time when we've been mostly away from them. Uh, and yes, we will have an administrative council meeting at 7 p.m. or 6, 6 p.m. And we'll be talking about our response to these new mask rules going forward and, and how we can continue to uh, or do ministry together. And um, so, stay tuned. But now, friends, we'll receive our benediction and then uh, no coffee this morning, but you're welcome to have fellowship time and greet our, our new babies. Okay. So, uh, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Oh, you never let go. Through the cold, through the storm. Oh, no, you never let go. In every high, every low. You never let go. 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 Let go of me. No, you never 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 let go of me. No, you never